thank you everyone um, for uh, and especially Ina for inviting me this evening. I just want to give you a little snip of a history of, and whet your appetite to see the life of Catherine Emma Maltwood as a multifaceted woman born in 1878. With that in mind, I would like you to I would like to read a couple of paragraphs from her husband John's will about his dear wife Catherine. First of all, I wish to express my humble gratitude for the happiness which has brought into my life by the love and true comradeship of my late devoted wife, Catherine. It has not only been a great joy, but also an honor to have shared my life with one possessing perennial creativeness and who has lived for the beauty, the love, and the truth in the widest form. The creation of her sculpture, watching it evolve to perfection, and the discovery of the ancient Somerset Zodiac and her researchers regarding it have been a continual source of inspiration. It, not only, it is not often that such beauty of character and instinctive knowledge of what is right and fitting and such sympathy are associated with such genius. I often think that mankind suffers from public publicity given to said subject of broken marriage while so little is given to those which are full of love, trust, and joy as all marriages should be. I remember when I first read John's accolade, I cried. I was at the library archives and I was crying about the deep love and beauty he describes of Catherine. I wonder how many of us sitting here right now would have written such a thing in our wills. Probably no one. Anyway, for those of you not familiar with Catherine or John Maltwood, these are their pictures. I contacted um, the gallery and now they're no longer at UVic, they're at a legacy gallery downtown. But the collection is still downstairs in the parking lot, if you can imagine that, in an underground vault. Very sad to see where you have to view it by appointment. Anyway, they're a lovely, charming couple. But I wasn't able to get bring anything tonight. This is from the program when the University of Victoria opened the Motwood Art Museum at their former home, The Thatch, which is now the Fireside Grill in Royal Oak on November the 4th, 1964. So you're 60 years ago when that was opened. And I remember going there myself, not for the opening, of course, but um, was there. Catherine Motwood had three siblings and had a privileged life in Woodford Green, London. Her father, George Sapsworth, was a wealthy leather merchant. Catherine grew up in a time shaped by the William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. Her early years focused on poetry, later turning to graphic arts, and finally the medium of sculpture, which she studied formally in Italy and as a Slade School in London under Sir George Frampton in 1896 to 1897. Catherine and John Maltwood were married on April the 2nd, 1901. Mr. Maltwood was an advertising executive for OXO, whose wealth made it possible for Catherine to focus on her art pursuits. Lucky for her. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, from 1911 to 1930, her works were exhibited regularly at the London Salon, the Royal Academy, and various London galleries, and were acclaimed by the critics of the day. In 1927, she held a one-woman show at her studio in Kensington, showing 16 pieces, including the Magnum Matter, the Head of Canada, Mills of God, the Holy Grail, Aspiration and Mirage were mediums varied from stone, alabaster, bronze, and copper electrite, electrotype on plaster. Two of these can be seen in this booklet here. So I'll just show you a couple of them. 
This is the uh, aspiration. You can't, it's a, not a great photocopy, but it's, you know, a person leaning backwards, so to speak. And then her other one is the Mills of God. She has lots and lots of very, very interesting um, material at the UVic archives. And there's finder guides and all kinds of things there too. Um, drawers and drawers full of manuscripts and personal notebooks and such. As well, Catherine was interested in ancient history, mythology, oriental uh, philosophy, Buddhism, the occult, and theosophy. I'm thinking I'm getting that right. That is the various forms of thought based on mystical, mystical insight into the divine nature. With her husband, John, she traveled to Egypt, the Middle East, India, China, Korea, Japan, and both South and North America, collecting many objects of art now housed at the Maltwood collection. The Maltwoods arrived in Victoria in 1938 and settled into the thatch in 1944. Their home was built initially as a restaurant, and through Mrs. Maltwood, it became a combination of studio and country house where she was able to display her sculptures, antique furniture, and various artworks. As I noted earlier, Catherine Maltwood had an interest in the mystical, and later in her life, she devoted herself to researching the Glastonbury Zodiac which she claimed to have discovered in 1925 while in living in Somerset, England. The discovery was a result of her intensive study of medieval Arthurism romances. She was interested in all legends of the Holy Grail and their connection with the visit of Joseph Ar of Ar Arimathea to Glastonbury. While tracing the map of the adventures of Arthur, in the kingdom of Logress, she felt to be, in fact, modern Somerset. Mrs. Motwa came to believe that the giant creatures with which the knights did battle actually existed in the form of giant earthworks laid out in a circular pattern 10 miles in diameter. She claimed that these effigies representing the figures of the zodiac explain symbolically the processes of nature brought about by the sun's seasonal pageant of death and rebirth and that the whole form of ritual complex devoted to the mystery religion widespread over the whole world in the second millennium before Christ. As a result of her findings, Catherine Maltwood published several books explaining her theories and in fact that work continued on the Glastonbury Zodiac after her death. It is interesting that many of what seem mis miscellaneous objects in the UVic archive are in fact directly related to Zodiac symbolism in one way or another. In 1940, Mrs. Maltwood was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in recognition not only for her work as a sculptress, but especially for her researches into history and legend. The Glastonbury Zodiac hangs in the McPherson Library archives for all to see. Catherine Emma Maltwood was a poet, philosopher, sculptor, artist, collector, <coughs> scholar, and as one historian writes, a prophet in antiquarian research. And known to many, the Maltwoods also have properties in Cowichan Bay and their home called Treetops on the ridge in Cordova Bay, where she would walk and sketch, being captivated by the views across the Strait of Georgia to the coastal mountains. She had a very interesting life, and in that she has a connection with Victoria and with Roy Oak in particular, makes her a multifaceted person that, as her husband John describes, who has lived for beauty, love, and truth. I wish I had met her. It should be noted that, as a final bequest, her ashes were spread on the property, 
Perhaps this is the foundation of numerous ghost stories accredited to the house. And Tim tells me that he's never actually seen her, but many of the staff have seen her. And of course, you may recognize John Adams, a regular of the Hallmark Society, who does ghost stories. Anyway, thank you again for allowing me to share just this brief history of a very interesting woman with a connection to Rollo. Thank you. And I'm sorry I had to cough through there. Now, one, one person did say to me that several of you have Maltwood stories, so it would be interesting to hear them. Identify yourself. Grant Cheldrake, uh, right. Catherine, pleased to meet you. Thank uh, you, We Grant. did meet one other Yes, time. we did. And uh, I uh, became very interested um, in this tree that she brought. Uh, and and it's, uh, it goes back to St. Joseph of Arimathea. And any of you know that your religious history is as good as me? Uh, which isn't very good, uh, came to Glastonbury in, so this is, some of this is legend probably, and my wife is watching me, uh, in, in 30 AD, supposedly before the death of Christ, which was 33 AD. Is that wrong? It's wrong. After, it came after, okay. So, and he planted a hawthorn and uh, it grew at the Glastonbury Abbey, uh, which has been destroyed uh, in the dissolution of the monasteries around 1550 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as this thing grew and grew, uh, it, uh, the legend grew around it, and it always bloomed on Christmas Day, which is very unusual for a hawthorn. Mm -hmm. And every Christmas, the queen or the uh, or the king or queen were, was taken, uh, uh, given a branch of the blossoming tree. Mm. And so Catherine Maltwood had a cutting of this tree brought to the property here mm -hmm. uh, at the thatch and uh, grew on the property. And then when the museum or when the uh, university uh, was endowed with everything, they dug up that tree and planted it behind the Unicenter. And you can go there now, you can go tomorrow, and you'll see this tree, and it's got a brass plaque, uh, I think probably done by her. Mm. And it tells, gives the history that this tree is, came from the, the tree, original tree at Glastonbury uh, in the first century AD. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very historic, and, and the university has it, and. Uh, just go through the unit center, out the back by the stage door, and you'll see this tree mm. to this day. So it's very interesting. Mm, that's other, a great story. I hadn't heard that uh, before. And the other, the other thing is, um, I did a little research last time I talked to you, and and went out to the archives and read the wills. I think you put the, yeah. those in there. Mm -hmm. And um, when they first came, when the Maltwoods first came, they uh, lived at 1101 Beach Drive. That's a little researching in Victoria Public uh, Library archives. I discovered this, and the house is still there to this day. And if anyone's interested, it has a for sale sign on it. And if you check, it's for sale for somewhere between seven and eight million. So <laughs> they always appreciated a good house. Well, they were. Um, if you read her will. It lists all of her stocks and bonds yeah, and, and, and tremendous amount of money. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to have seen his. You yeah, know, yeah. It, it would, because yeah. she, she was financially independent herself. And in most yeah. of them, a, a huge portfolio of Canadian stocks. Yeah. And they had uh, their artwork, of course, was yeah. valued quite, quite richly as well. So. The, the, uh, so many of us grew up in absolute poverty around here, and we had, we had no idea of the wealth that was, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. inside that house and, and uh, that that uh, they they had grown up with. So it was wonderful. So next uh, next uh, volunteer. <laughs> Hi, Harvey. Well, my story goes back to the late 50s, 57 or so, when I started working at Royal Oak Service Station across the road from the Maltwood Museum. 
I served, uh, I graduated in 59 and then took a mechanics apprenticeship under Gary Wilner and his father Otto Wilner owned the service station at the time. Mm -hmm. So some of my recollections are stories that I heard from Otto Wilner who had been there for many years before me about Mr. Mullet, not too much about his wife. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> I do remember him coming over with his little glass jug, one gallon jug and getting lawnmower gas which we were able to dispense into glass containers in those years. It's illegal now. I don't know whether he actually did the lawn mowing, but he would come over and get his one gallon of gas. And on occasion, he'd come by and fill up his car. And I remember one day he was standing there watching the numbers tick by on the, uh, on the gas pump, and he said to me, I used to make money that fast. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, you pompous so-and-so. <laughs> and I don't know if he was pompous or not, but that's the way I read that comment. And he always, I always remember him walking back and forth in front of the service station when he'd go down to the shopping center in his plus fours. And Gary and I would kind of poke fun at it and make comments. And the boss always said, well, if you could afford to wear those, you would too. Yeah. And then the other story that I remember is in about 1950, he, the Korean War broke out. And I think he thought that they were going to stop building cars like they did in the Second World War. So he rushed downtown to Pacific Chrysler and bought two new cars. He bought a nice big Chrysler for him to drive and a little 1950 Dodge two-door business coupe for his wife. And they drove the cars, nothing special about that until she got to the point where she could no longer drive. So he thought, no sense keeping two cars. He sold the big one and kept the little one because he preferred to drive it. Well, I use the term drive loosely because we would hear him stop for mail down at the post office, which was down about where the Thai restaurant place mm -hmm. is in those days. And we'd hear this engine revving up and he would slip the clutch. I don't know what gear he was in, but he would regulate the speed of the car by how much he slipped the clutch and kept the foot right down on the gas. This led to the fact that every few months or every six months or so, Gary or I would have to go over, take the starter off of the, off of the car, bring it to the shop, blow it out, clean the, all of the carbon dust from the clutch lining, because the starter bendix wouldn't engage and it wouldn't start. So we would do that, oil it up, put it back on. The first time we did that, we charged them $2. The shop rates then were $4 an hour. So we charged them for a half an hour's labor. He came over, he was just as mad as a hatter. He said, for $2, you couldn't have done the job right. So from then on, we charged him $4 and he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> because he was, he was, it happened more than once. He slipped the clutch so much that this would, was a reoccurring failure. Then I heard that uh, in about 1962, he sold the car. And my boss, he always wanted to buy this because when he sold it, 12 or 13 years old, it had 12,000 miles on it. And the story goes he was on his sixth clutch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my recollections of John Maltland. And he lived to <laughs> almost uh, 101. And he did remarry after, uh, after Catherine's death. He he remarried the the woman who was her caregiver. She had MS. Yeah. But, uh, she had many socialite friends in the art world here. She was very well connected. There is a beautiful book by Rosemary Brown, the former MLA for uh, BC, who wrote, uh, I don't know if she was doing it as a thesis or, or what, but there's a really very uh, good book written by her on Catherine Walkway's life here. Next. Story? I love stories. <laughs> Hello, I'm Morgan Scott Osler. Hello, Morgan. Hello. So my recollections of Kath Lee, uh, Catherine Maltwood uh, begin with um, lessons that we used to take from Mrs. Doris Leedham Hobbs. She was a wonderful uh, artist in our community and also was tremendous in gathering a lot of 
bring children together on a Saturday and having art lessons here or over at the, the Royal Oak Women's Institute. And uh, it, it was our first taste in, with culture and wonderful discussions and reviewing other artworks. And one day, to our amazement, she said she'd arranged for us to go to the uh, Maltwood home. And of course, as a child of seven or eight, it seemed like a fantasy, this thatched cottage over there, and that we were going to go in and meet uh, a Mrs. Maltwood. And uh, so uh, off we went, really quite tense, uh, quite uncomfortable, and Mrs. Maltwood was sitting almost enthroned, and she had a veil over her head and veiled clothing very much. I hadn't realized that she was involved with the William Morris movement mm -hmm. because it was those kind of fabrics that she mm -hmm. was wearing mm -hmm. and very definite, the outlines of the Morris were in the, the pattern, the fabric. And um, so she looked at us, wretched little urchins, I'm sure, in her <laughs> eyes. And I was supposed, she, she was watching us so intensely that I felt her eyes burning into us I think she was concerned that we might pocket some of the, her collection, mm. that kind of look. There wasn't any kindness there. It was a fierce gaze at us as we tried to look suitably impressed with the various pieces that Mrs. Hobbs was explaining to us. So that was just the only memory I had of her. Um, I, I wish that I had a chance as a, a, a more mature person to go and see this incredible collection. I'm excited to think that the signs of the Zodiac are in the McPherson Library. And in the archives. In the Downs, archives, are they? Because oh, I thought, yeah. I'm going to do that. It's just right yeah. right when you walk in. It's just yeah. above where you walk in. Uh -huh. Or the last time it was when I checked. Well, of course, we knew nothing about the Glastonbury story at that time, but Sheila and I have been going back, to, uh, back and forth to Ireland to... Uh, a family member uh, to care for our very elderly sister who has since died quite recently and from about 19, oh, 2000, maybe 1999, 2000, we've probably been going back once or twice a year. We've been cycling through the, the southeast and really enjoying our Irish heritage and enjoying our Irish passports as well and the free train rides and mm -hmm. things. But uh, we also have the wonderful advantage of staying with a friend of our elderly sister and the friend turns out to be a member of the Daughters of Isis. Now the Daughters of Isis is a, I can only explain it as a very mystical, generally female organization who recognizes uh, Isis as a, a, a godlike person and her husband, Orisus, I believe it is. and. Um, the leader of the Daughters of Isis is Lady Olivia Robertson. She and her brother were Anglicans, very active. He was an Anglican minister. But they both had some kind of a revelation on a bus in England and decided <laughs> that, that, uh, the, uh, that there was more truth in the stories that are coming out of the early Egyptian research on the, the faith of the people. Uh, several thousand years ago than there was in the Anglican religion. And they were transformed. They lived in Clonagall Castle, a most amazing place in, uh, about an hour south of where we stayed uh, when we were visiting with our sister in Ireland. And we began attending the uh, gatherings at the, in the castle, uh, the, uh, in the dungeon. Uh, the dungeon had uh, the the 12 rooms in the dungeon were um, the, the signs of the, of the zodiac as you moved around and, and we would have rituals and we'd move from one section to another. There, there was a well that had been there for 6,000 years in the dungeon and that water would be used for some kinds of ritual and cleansing and blessings. We were uh, charmed by the uh, story that Lady Olivia herself, who was 93 when we last saw her a couple of years ago, she, uh, in her enthusiasm, plunged into the well <laughs> and managed to get out, extricate oh, herself. With, there was no one home. 
Wow. And there was no one around the castle when she plunged into the well. So what she did was she took her feet and stretched them as far as she could, and she literally walked, walked up, up the, the inside wow. of the walls and, and uh, survived the day when she was an elderly woman. Just mm. extraordinary. However, <coughs> being Irish, I have a hard time staying on track with the story because there's so much. <laughs> it's unbelievable. My sister and I on the beaches calling up the spirits of the angels on Earth Day in Ireland with all the druids around us. It's great stuff. We loved it. Yeah, so I'll get to the book. Okay. <laughs> So we're staying with this princess, one of the founding princesses of the, from the castle, and uh, she, there, in the room that she assigned me to, there was a book on the windowsill that I really didn't look at, and one day I was sort of, I guess, stalling for time doing something, and I looked at this book, this picture on the cover of the book, it said Catherine Maltwood. <sighs> Couldn't believe it, opened it up, and here it was the story of Catherine's research or her identifying the, the uh, signs of the zodiac in Glastonbury. Uh, and it had all the charts and how she read into them and what the landmarks were and how you could uh, trace this in order to confirm the truth of what she had found. Most extraordinary that she, we li she lived down the road from us here in Royal Oak and the the priestesses that we met when we told them sto their, our story were utterly astounded as well because she was very much a person of Glastonbury, not yeah. of some obscure mm -hmm. uh, a village out in the colonies. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that was, uh, and then after discovering this, uh, just our last trip to Ireland, just before we uh, left uh, out of Heathrow, uh, we arranged for our cousin to take us up to uh, Glastonbury. And it was so meaningful to us. It was just an entrancing place to be. It, it had an energy that was unbelievable. There's a Glastonbury festival that gathers mm -hmm. 300,000 people yeah. every year yeah. that it's camp huge. out in the fields, just massive, the hillsides. Yeah. And they're all, uh, they're all people that are very mystical, very much into the Druid beliefs and so on. As you know, in England recently, the Druid belief has become uh, sanctioned as a religion with, as, uh, with all of the uh, accoutrements and exemptions of the other churches. So uh, that was very meaningful for us to be at Glastonbury and to think that our neighbor here, Catherine Maltwood, was the person who brought this to fruition. Mm -hmm. So that there you go. Wow, that's an excellent story. Well, she'll come and visit you tonight, I'm sure. Yeah. You know? Well, I hope that, you know, I mean, um, the the house here, you know, I don't know if, I'm sure you would know this, this story. Um, the university put the house up for sale um, late 70s. They tried to break the trust earlier than that, but they thought better of it. Um, and anyway, there was a deal with the district of Saanich, and Saanich purchased the home for $325,000. And then it was discovered that um, there was an adjoining lot that wasn't in the original package. So they spent another $27,000 and bought the, this little odd piece of lot that's on the north side of the property. Um, and and then so Sanish just rented it out and it became a restaurant. But um, um, Dominique Chapeau ran Chanticleer there for many, many years. Um, and then that went bankrupt in 1996. But in Catherine's will, she actually, I don't have it here with me, but she actually states that when when she she initially left the the house 
um, and our, her collection to the University of British Columbia. And they didn't want it because she was connected with them somehow. Anyway, they didn't want it because it was over here. So UVic was just coming online. So uh, her husband arranged with, U um, with UVic to, for them to um, have, have the endowment. And it was a pretty hefty, hefty endowment. It was uh, around um, $200,000 plus every, everything. So the university had had the museum there for many years. And then, um, of course, it didn't quite meet museum standards, you know, being the, the grand hall and that. It wasn't um, temperature controlled and that. So it was, um, Saanich purchased the property, as I said, in the end of 79, 1980, and then they leased it out. And then um, the restaurant, uh, went out of business in 1996, and this is where I come in, is that um, the municipality received several bids, and they accepted one bid from a Vancouver developer who wanted to put change the house to a micro pub, uh, build an L-shaped shopping center, and have a McDonald's at the bottom. And we went, oh no, this is not going to happen. You know, so I kind of rallied the troops, and and we had meetings, such as you had your meetings, um, and one person that attended said, "Well, why don't you just resurrect the Royal Oak Community Association?" We said, "Sure, why not?" You know, um, we had no idea what that meant. You know, so if we had, you know, uh, hindsight, we would have become the friends of the Chanticleer or the friends of the Thatch because a community association is all about development and uh, dealing with Saanich and learning way more things than I ever wanted to know. I could have a master's in planning if I, if I wanted to. Um, but through, through this, it, it, um, what came through was that we were not going to let Catherine's home be turned into something that didn't honor her. But getting back to her will, she says um, she's left all this money and for this museum and that. And she actually says, I don't want you to have a tea room at the house because there are many tea rooms in the neighborhood. And then it becomes a rest. You know, it was originally a restaurant. It was built in, in the 30s as a, as a destination restaurant. But because of the war, Gas was rationed and food was rationed, so um, the restaurant closed down. Um, Did Catherine own the property as opposed to her husband then? Did she dispose uh, of it? Uh, it was it was her home. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, um, I. You know what? I I really think it was in her name. Well, she yeah. Seems to be disposing of it in her will. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, any, anyway, like I said, she was independently wealthy. But, um, you know, so I, I hope that I have honored her from um, campaigning to that poor development where we took two and a half years of my life um, before council made a decision and then they actually backed away from that and then they put it up for sale again. And... Um, the Petropolis family and Donna Thomas purchased the the property and have turned it into a, a lovely restaurant. But they have they have honored that home um, and what and what it meant to this community. And um, they, I think they, I think Catherine would be pleased with that compared to what the original uh, proposal was to turn it into a pub. You know, so, um, and you know, I just want to think that she kind of wanders around there and because her ashes are on site, um, thinking that it's okay, you know, that, that she's still here with us. Yeah. Maybe I should talk to that Long Island, Long Island medium and see if I can connect with her or something. <laughs> she's a fascinating woman, you know. The Long Island medium. medium. Yeah, she's, she's a, uh, she talks to, to spirits, mm -hmm. you know, she's on TV, on TV, yeah, 
Channel 37. I, she's a very interesting person, you know, to, to be able to communicate certain energies that she gets and communicates to other people in the room. The, the tragedy of, of the story is that the collection is in the basement. Yes. Not on display. But, but yeah. not under temperature control. Yes. It, oh, yeah. It's completely temperature control. Yeah. They have um, these huge shelving units that roll apart, yeah. and different the objects are on the shelving unit. But then there, there's also within the library archives itself, mm -hmm. they have huge pull out drawers, but you just look at the finding guide and you ask the person to bring it to you, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, really fascinating. You could spend years reading all of her research. If I ever went to Glastonbury, I would certainly do quite a bit of research to have a, a, an appreciation of what she did. But your story was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. I'm fascinated by her. I feel, I feel a sense of loss that we didn't fully appreciate who she was yeah. and, and how meaningful her collection was. Right. right. You know, but it's always that way. That when well, when you, you when you're back, when you're seven years old, yeah. the, the 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 things that you have in your life are all about playing and yeah. and how, how how not to do your homework uh -huh. and those sorts of things. As opposed to, you know, I often thought about that with my own mother. You know, it wasn't till you know I'm I'm well into my fifties and and or no forties, sorry, no late thirties. Um, my mom passed away when I was in my late thirties, and thinking how how she never talked about her family life and that. And then uh, six yeah. months before she died, she told me, yeah. you know, some a very sad story. So, um, you know, but when you're a child, you don't, those sorts of things don't come into it. You don't ask questions. It's only later on in life. And groups like this where you're asking questions now and, and you look for resources of people here, yeah. someone will know someone, will know someone, will know someone. It's fascinating. Yeah. By what we 30 see. years ago, I was in New York City and I, I went to the um, a radio television museum and you, they had, you could sit in booths and listen to old radio programs and go into theaters and see Ed Sullivan shows and, and, and it was fascinating because I was reliving my childhood, you know, of sitting around. And and um, listening to the radio and watching Bonanza on Sunday night to be able to stay up to nine o'clock, you know. I mean, that was, you know. I I mean, you see these shows and and how extraordinary that that they've been preserved for, you know, as an adult, and then we can translate that to our children, you know. I mean, look, we're grandparents, and our kids grow up are listening to Beatles music and the Rolling Stones, and yet those groups are still going, you know. Um, pretty extraordinary. fascinating story and and it's so different from my life you know that's what captivates